we can get started. Um, just a, a very brief welcome to you all, and particularly to our, our speakers who are um, you get, the, the title's interesting, Global Nuclear Cardiology, um, hopefully not too controversial, but interesting from various countries around the world. And um, I welcome my co-chair, Enrique, who I've known for some time from IAEI. He has to excuse himself early, he's going to the airport early, so um, we'll let him start the, the ball rolling. Uh, just a reminder, please, if you don't mind, to switch mobile phones to silent or switch them off if you can possibly do that. And check the apps to see that room changes don't affect any of you. And with that, um, I'll start by asking Dr. Sam Wright, who will talk on the role of nuclear cardiology and clinical practice in Australia and New Zealand. Thanks, Sam. All right. So uh, I'd like to once again thank Nathan and the organisers for asking me to, or for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so within a, uh, Australia and New Zealand, particularly Australia at the moment uh, where I practice, there's uh, significant discussion around the role of nuclear cardiology in its place in the referral stream. It's still the background to our myocardial perfusion imaging is it's backed by robust data over a number of years to accurately detect obstructive coronary artery disease with, with, with high sensitivity uh, and specificity. But its greatest power and where it still fits into the, 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 the cardiology landscape in Australia and New Zealand is clearly in its prognostic power, where a normal MPI uh, offers a cardiac event rate of well less than one per year, with abnormal MPI having a cardiac mortality of uh, 0.5 to 4.2% 4, 4 per year. And particularly with our ageing population, uh, with increasing comor uh, comorbidities, the importance that vasodilator stress has similar accuracy and can easy, easily be, be performed. It should be remembered that the functional capacity of less than six METs is still the strongest predictor of all-cause mortality. So in Australia, there's about 75,000 uh, MPI studies performed per year uh, from the, the uh, MBS statistics. And the prognostic power is really the ischemic burden and being able to risk stratify patients with no or, or low ischemia uh, to medical management versus those with significant ischemia uh, to uh, revascularization. And this is its great power over the other diagnostic tools uh, that are being used routinely in Australia today. So within uh, Australia and New Zealand, what are, the, what are the current challenges? And the, the biggest one at the moment, I think, facing nuclear cardiology in Australia particularly, is our Medicare review. So for those of you from overseas, the Medicare system in Australia is how the government pays for uh, all diagnostic uh, studies and other, other healthcare benefits. Uh, and uh, predominantly a money-based uh, review has, has, has recently been undertaken to look at obsolete investigations and how, uh, how referrals uh, for particular investigations should be framed uh, so, so that the, the supply can meet the demand, basically. And that has some significant implications for nuclear cardiology, where we're clearly a test that is, is more, it costs more than a, a non-invasive stress echo. The other threats uh, to nuclear cardiology within uh, Australia and New Zealand are definitely the increasing use of stress echo and CTCA, and to a lesser extent, the, the invasive use of fractional flow reserve by our interventional colleagues. Uh, the radiation burden, which I'll speak about uh, a little bit later, is, is a significant issue for Australia and New Zealand, as we have one of the lowest rate of uh, stress-only studies uh, in the world. Uh, cost, uh, we need to continually improve our accuracy and hopefully the ischemia trial when it comes to its conclusion will demonstrate outcome benefit with ischemia directed revascularization which will hopefully uh, improve our, our, our position and, and jockeying for position for diagnostic tests. So this is just a slide uh, of, a, of a really a decade of the growth of the different uh, modalities within a, a Australia. So MPI has basically stayed very static around the 75,000 uh, studies per year, whereas there's been a sharp increase in stress echo, CTCA, and even invasive angiography uh, over that decade. During that period of time, we're also starting to get the more obese patients, those with more comorbidities, and those that can't exercise. So as well as our numbers not growing, there's been a shift to more high-risk patients, and, and I guess a harder workload, and, and probably the correlate is, is less normal studies. That growth is being, being driven somewhat by radiation, 
access to services, but largely by the uh, the number of, of cardiologists that are being trained that, that come out being able to perform stress echocardiogram. So the, it was difficult to to, to access exact exact figures, but for the for the 2014 to 2016 uh, period, there was on average 45 to 60 new cardiology fellows in Australia who all come out capable of setting up a stress echo service doing stress echo. And over the same period of time, there would have been at most one or two nuclear cardiologists finishing training each of those years, which is is, is not necessarily an issue for self referral, but it's that larger larger broad number of cardiologists that influence the greater referral pattern. So concerningly for nuclear cardiology in Australia, the, uh, the working group to, to review these indications uh, have basically come in up with uh, criteria that would need to be met to, to, to fund an MPI, whereas previously it's been basically accepted appropriate use criteria. A lot of them are very appropriate. The, the slight concern for, for, for stress nuclear in Australia is that in patients having diagnostic scans where there's no history of coronary artery disease, it is now a secondary test to stress, they're proposing to make it a secondary test to stress echo unless there is increased body habitus, unable to exercise, unable to access stress echo in a timely fashion or that they've failed a stress echo. So it is, it is obviously going to be a challenge moving forward if the government mandates uh, rebatable services are easier to, to, to obtain for, for general practitioners and other referrals referring to stress echo in preference to stress nuclear. Moving more to the, the, the clinical side of thing and how it fits into our day-to-day our, our -day patients within Australia and New Zealand, we need to have a little bit of a look how it compares to its competitors. So comparing it to CTCA, the PROMISE trial uh, published in 2015 randomised about 10,000 patients to either CTCA or functional imaging. What it found was that there was an increase in revascularizations with the CT uh, strategy first up, which was statistically significant, but no difference in hard cardiac events. And that was the, the similar sort of uh, picture with two meta-analyses published over the last couple of years. The first by Cantoni with about 25,000 full patients, which again in indicated increased revascularizations with CTCA, but no difference in events. And uh, uh, Green and the similar working group, no statistical difference in pooled annualized event rates and a neg in normal uh, MPI over about 30,000 patients. So in our day-to-day -day practice, the, the, there's definitely, when we're comparing CTCA first up to stress nuclear, a bias towards revascularising patients with anatomic evidence of disease with little effect on hard outcomes. But both modalities definitely offer safe pathways for the risk stratification of chest pain and, and high NPV. And I think we need to, as a nuclear community, keep coming back to studies like this so that the new sexy, if you like, imaging modalities coming through do not become the uh, the, the, the pathway of least resistance. Fractional flow reserve is, is rising considerably uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and, and for those of you that aren't familiar with fractional flow reserve, it's, it's basically an estimated proportion of the normal coronary flow available to the distal myocardium. So at, at cardiac catheter, the, um, the, the, the use of a pressure wire uh, is placed proximal and distal to the uh, to the lesion, and then maximum hyperemia is achieved with an adenosine infusion, looking for a, a drop in in blood pressure and a, and, and basically a ratio. Um, now the future trial uh, from a couple of years ago looked at FFR guided management in multivessel disease versus angiographic management, and enrolment and trial and the trial was ceased early due to a significantly increased cardiac mortality rate in the FFR arm. And I think this is where the advocacy within the nuclear community in Australia and New Zealand needs to push that our studies are backed by robust data and if, 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 if studies like this continue to come out, then fractional flow reserve should be used with caution in, in, in some of these patients. Just while we're on fractional flow reserve, there, there, there seems to be an underestimation of the, of the extent of disease compared to nuclear studies. And then there's a couple of reasons uh, that, that that could be. One is within the nuclear community, we've known for some time about the ne necessity to avoid caffeine for 24 hours before adenosine dipyridamol studies. 
that hasn't translated uh, into the interventional world for the use of FFR, even though they're using adenosine infusions. So while we prepare our patients caffeine-free for 24 hours, it's quite common that the patient fasted four, hour for an, four hours from an angiogram, had a coffee just before that. That may lead to the underestimation of the, the extent of ischemia and patients that potentially need a stent getting managed medically. I don't really want to go into fluid dynamics, but there is also a phenomenon where the uh, predicted, uh, if, if you have multiple stenoses within a single uh, artery, that FFR will underestimate the significance of a particular lesion, again leading to uh, medical management where, where there may actually be an ischemic burden. And I think that's indefinitely my practice in Australia, a lot of the cases where we've sent someone with a positive, positive nuclear scan and they come back and say, but the FFR was negative, so we managed it medically. And there are two reasons that that discrepancy may, may, may be occurring. And I think as a nuclear community in Australia and New Zealand, we have to be pushing this, this sort of data so that they're not the, the person that does the last test, they're right and, and we're seen as wrong. The other big moving area, uh, I think, in Australia and New Zealand that we have to embrace is the, cor is the coronary calcification assessment in our MPIs. So we know that a negative MPI confers a low risk of cardiac events, but so does a negative stress echo. But severe coronary artery calcification is a major predictor of hard cardiac events in patients with normal MPI or stress echo. We know this. There's robust evidence for the Gatston score. We can now, and Steve Stowers has done a lot of, a lot of work on this, we can now uh, use the Shemesh ordinal calcium score on our low dose CTs to risk to risk stratify um, patients uh, with, with normal studies, and this is this is an area that we need to grow and where we can set ourselves apart from stress echo. I'm now getting a lot of GP referrers, particularly the ones with a, uh, a bias in in preventative medicine, that will actually send their patients on the request form stress nuclear plus comment on coronary calcium. And I think this is an area we need to embrace as a different point from, from stress echo that can, can guide aspirin and statin therapy. Just an example, we have two, two fairly normal nuclear scans, and this is the low dose CT. I know which one I'd prefer to have, and if I had the bottom one, I'd definitely be heading down to the chemist and getting aspirin and statin. Compared to stress echo, which is, is, is what the, the government here is pro, uh, proposing, becomes the first non-invasive test in a lot of cases, we're much more sensitive because we pick up levels of flow mal distribution uh, early on in the ischemic cascade, so are much better at picking up minor disease that may not need a stent but may benefit from a beta blocker. So we're much better suited to guide medical management with mild ischemia. We probably have superior pharmacological agents to stress echo and much better suited in left bundle branch block, prior infarct, resting wall motion, abnormality and obesity, which thankfully uh, we're seeing much more of with our ageing population. And I've already talked about the diagnostic, uh, the, the, the addition of coronary calcium in a negative test. So radiation, so in, in Australia and New Zealand, the, there was a paper uh, published last year that looked at the radiation doses, and the mean effective dose from an MPI is just under nine millisieverts. But there is potential uh, for significant reduction in sub and, and potentially sub millisievert studies, but definitely with increased uh, camera technology, stress only studies to get that number down. Radiation is a big uh, issue pushed by a lot of our, our, our non-nuclear colleagues in, in determining tests. The, the advent of CTCA, there is a lot of talk that they can do one millisievert studies, two millisievert studies. But what we do know is that the radiobiology of lower dose rates is thought more favourable than total dose. So if we're comparing CTCA to MPI, if you could take a three millisievert CTCA where the dose is a minute over one second, compared to our nine millisievert uh, MPI administered with a half-life of six hours, the CTCA dose rate is actually more than 5,000 times our study, which means that on MPIs, while the, to the total dose is, is higher, there's more time for the cells to repair themselves uh, and, and may actually be, uh, have a less harmful effect than, than, high, than, than significant radiation over a short period of time. If we look at the ways the IAEA suggest uh, 
optimizing protocols, the, the areas that we can really focus on in Australia and New Zealand currently and, and we're working on is performance of more stress-only imaging, camera-based uh, redu uh, dose reduction strategies, particularly the CTAC, multiple uh, positioning, high technology software and hardware, and weight-based doses, dosing for technetium where you can significantly reduce your dose. So stress-only imaging, only, uh, so 80 per cent of, of stress nuclear in Australia and New Zealand is performed as rest stress, which means you don't even have the option of stress-only imaging, which confers a higher radiation dose from, from the start. It's often preferred due to ease of scheduling workflow, but sometimes because of the higher risk patients. But what we need to be aware of in Australia and New Zealand is that there's good evidence now that the, the normal stress-only studies have similar prognostic power to arrest stress, and that we can actually predict with reasonable certainty uh, which patients will be able to, to, to successfully have a stress-only study and not need a rest. And so Deval back in 2012 came up with this, this uh, list of clinical variables and, and basically if you score four or less there's a high chance that you'll get away with a stress-only study. And so in departments where we're done. So I'll just finish up. So in departments where arrest stress is done for purely or predominantly scheduling workflow uh, reasons, this may be a strategy uh, to select patients that can have a stress first study. So I probably don't need to go through my summary, um, but that's sort of sort of what in the interest of time. But uh, I, th I think what we really need in, in Australia and New Zealand at the moment we, with a potential restriction of services and referral patterns is strong advocacy for nuclear cardiology because we, may, we remain a test with a lot of evidence, a lot of prognostic power and, and really being able to determine uh, the ischemic burden and lead medical management uh, is going to be paramount. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Prem Soman. Uh, the lecture is the role of nuclear cardiology in clinical practice in North America. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks again for the invitation to be here at this meeting. So I thought I would start with a couple of slides laying out sort of the big picture view of our American health system. I hasten to add that I am by no means a health policy expert. And if there's one thing that stayed uh, stable over several decades, it's the fact that our health system is extremely complex. Now, if you look at spending in the United States, uh, there is government spending and private sector spending for health care. Government spending is mostly Medicare, which gives free health care to people who are uh, older than 65 years of age. Medicaid, which attends to people who are below a certain income threshold, children's and then the veterans and military uh, health insurance policies. Now, the vast majority of employed people get employer-based health insurance uh, from their place of employment. People who are self-employed purchase their own health insurance. <laughs> and there is a proportion of the population that remains uninsured, mostly because they don't fall into the category of Medicaid, but yet find it difficult to buy health insurance. And a small proportion of these patients make a determined choice to remain uninsured. So this is how the healthcare dollars in the uh, United States are, are distributed. And in 2013, which I think is the most recent data, about 65% of the healthcare dollars come from the government. In contrast, if you look at healthcare facilities, hospitals, the majority are in the private sector and the majority are so-called not-for-profit corporations. So this not-for-profit definition is purely a corporation-based definition. If a um, hospital provides some of the uh, services that the state is supposed to provide, they then get this categorization of a not-for-profit corporation. They usually make substantial amounts of profit anyways. And then there is the government sector, uh, which is the Veterans Administration and some military hospitalizations. So this is a slide that you have all seen. Um, and what it tells you is that in most parts of the world, there is some sort of a linear relationship between healthcare dollars and outcome. And as you can see here, the US is completely off the charts. 
And in the most recent survey, we spend about 18% of our GDP on healthcare and do not have commensurate healthcare outcomes. And that is a um, whole day of debate in and of itself. Now, based on all of this, there have been some recent major healthcare legislation changes, and I'm just going to point out to two. In 2011, the much touted uh, Obamacare was introduced. This had nothing to do with the provision of health care by the government, but it was a move to expand and improve private health insurance and reduce its costs. And the two major uh, attributes of this was guaranteed issue. So you had some very important provisions, such as no denial of health insurance for pre-existing conditions, no lifetime caps, equity of premium, irrespective of age, gender, and geography, um, the dependent children, uh, the definition was expanded to 26 years, free preventive care, and minimum some minimum policy standards. Now, to allow the insurance industry to cater to this, a mandate with a penalty was introduced so that if as an individual or as an employer you fail to have health insurance, then you would have a tax penalty imposed. This was one of the most unpopular laws passed in the United States in the recent past, and it looks like this particular attribute of Obamacare is going to be repealed by the current government. The second uh, important healthcare legislation, which I think was an important change in philosophy, was the introduction of MACRA, or the Medicare Access and the Children's Health Insurance Plan Reauthorization. And for the first time since 1964, when Medicare was established, we have made a conscientious decision to make a graded transition from fee-for-service to fee-for-quality, and so finally have an opportunity to catch up with the rest of the world in how we deliver healthcare. Now, in the late 1990s and 2000, many surveys showed that there was a disproportionate growth in imaging services. This led to multiple regulatory um, actions, such as reimbursement cuts for myocardial perfusion imaging, among other things. The institution of appropriate use criteria, which was a, an act by physicians to offer a guide for referring physicians to appropriately refer patients for advanced imaging tests, and the pre-authorization requirement by certain private payers who wouldn't pay for, for example, a myocardial perfusion scan unless it was pre-authorized. So on that background, if you look at the total nuclear medicine procedures performed in the United States and look at nuclear cardiology procedures as a percentage of the total nuclear medicine procedures, 50% of our total nuclear medicine procedures are, are nuclear cardiology procedures, which is a substantially higher proportion than the rest of the world. For example, in Europe, it is only about 14%. And this map tells you the density of myocardial perfusion imaging scans performed. In North America, it's more than a hundred, uh, more than a thousand myocardial perfusion scans per 100,000 of the population, substantially more than the rest of the world. Now, these are data only from Medicare Part B. And, and so the total number of SPECT and PET scans performed are approximately three times this number. But the proportion between SPECT and PET and the general trends are, are valid. And you can see here that in the last several years, there has been a significant reduction in the total number of myocardial perfusion scans performed. And it looks like since that in 2016, this trend is slowly begun to reverse again. Important to note that myocardial perfusion imaging PET uh, is only a small proportion and it's increased from 2% in 2010 to about 5% in 2015. And there continues to be a small increase in the proportion, but it is only a very small percentage of the total MPS scans performed. Now, the next several studies show you results from a joint survey performed by the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and a company called MedAxium, which performs healthcare-related surveys. And I want to um, add here that this, like all surveys, the, the, the percentage of people who responded was quite small. So this is taken from a small sample of nuclear cardiologists who are surveyed across the country. And these slides show you that the majority of studies are performed by cardiology-based physicians. And again, in practices, SPECT 
um, is, is provided in, in, in almost all practices and PET and PET CT only in a small number of practices. Now, we have a system of national accreditation of laboratories, and you can see here um, that um, about 95% of our laboratories undergo mandatory yearly accreditation by a national body. And as a reflection of this, because one of the criteria for accreditation is that a lab is required to have written standard protocols that are submitted at the time of accreditation so that there's some uniformity in the performance of studies. And so 100% of the surveyed labs um, had standard written protocols. Now, the most recent survey uh, shows that about 51% of studies are done with regadinosan. And this is a significant change because in the 2013 survey, 80% um, uh, of studies were performed with regular sun. So it, it, was, it took over the market uh, when it was introduced, and now we are seeing a slow decline in regular sun, mostly because reimbursement is increasingly being bundled. And so people want to use the cheaper cost tracers. Technetium 99M Sestamibi still predominates the market. A small percentage of patients still use thallium. Um, and it is one of our important missions at the American Society of Nuclecardiology with a view to reduce, reducing radiation dose that we um, very actively discourage people from using thallium except in times of technetium shortage. Sodium iodide cameras predominate, but there's an increasing proportion of the market uh, for solid state cameras. Many centers, like my own, now provide, do 90% of our studies um, on, on solid state cameras. Um, and, and a large number of uh, centers actually institute, actively institute radiation reduction methods. We've also become very aware of AUC, and uh, about three-fourths of our labs actively track appropriate use uh, criteria, uh, as we do in our lab and report it um, on the results. In a large study performed, uh, I think this was in about 2013 or so, uh, about 13% of our referrals were inappropriate. And it is quite interesting that multiple studies show a 10 to 15 percentage of inappropriate um, testing. Of course, there are some uh, categories that are uncertain, some that are unclassified. But this is much lower than what we all anticipated. Now, I work in a university setting. It's a completely referral-based lab. Nobody has a financial incentive in referring a patient to my lab, but we still have a 10 to 15% inappropriate testing rate. And this really in the, uh, emphasizes the role that education can play in reducing inappropriate testing. All studies, all studies show that these two categories form the largest proportion of inappropriate studies, low-risk asymptomatic patients and preoperative evaluation in, uh, for low-risk surgery in patients with good functional capacity. Now, it's interesting to note that if you look at data from England and Canada, which do not provide health care for a fee-for-service fee paradigm, there still is a, a slightly smaller but similar rate of inappropriate testing, and the pattern is exactly uh, these, these two categories. So uh, uh, that's a, it's a very important uh, point to make for um, uh, education. Now, despite this, um, if you look at trends in the country, and this is data from Dan Berman's lab, um, if you look at trends in the past decade, there is a substantially lower proportion of patients that have positive scans. So in my lab, we perform 3,000 scans a year. In our system, which has 29 hospitals, we perform about 25,000 scans per year, and about 10 to 15 percent of our scans are, are positive, despite the fact that the, the rate of inappropriate testing is relatively low. Now, why is this? This is data from our lab uh, looking at pretest probability estimation with the Diamond and Forrester criteria. All our guidelines and AUC criteria are completely dependent on pretest probability estimations using the Diamond and Forrester criteria. And here in this data from my lab is a comparison of the different categories of pretest probability using the criteria and a comparison of the prevalence, actual prevalence of an abnormal spec scan compared to the expected prevalence using the Diamond Forrester criteria. And you can see here that even in the 
um, high, highest risk category, these criteria significantly overestimate the pretest property disease. And this is one reason that I think the NICE guidelines in England has completely gone away from pretest probability estimation in stable coronary artery disease. And my final slide here are the regulatory measures taking effect. Um, you can see here in this graph uh, that shows you data from 2000 to 2006 that there was, as I mentioned, a disproportionate increase in uh, spending on imaging services compared to total uh, Medicare carrier costs. And it looks like um, in, in the years uh, starting from 2006, coinciding approximately with all the regulatory changes and the institution of AUC, that trend is now actively um, reversing. Thank you very much. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to ASNIC 2008, which will be in San Francisco. And I tell everybody, is if, if there is one easy trip to make from Australia to the US, it is this one, to San Francisco. So okay. please come. Thanks, Prim. I'll now call on Jean Vitolo, who we all have been known here, to talk about South America. Latin America, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. So, discuss in the next 15 minutes the challenges and opportunities for nuclear cardiology in Latin America. This one? Yeah. yeah. And I'll start with these two cases. Case one, a 51 year old man. He lives in Brazil. He's obese. He's diabetic. He's, he has heart disease suspected. Case number two, a 54 year old female who also lives in Brazil. Same profile, obese, diabetic, heart disease suspected. These two patients were sent to our labs. And as you can see in this heart rhythm, both of these patients are rested. And they didn't know they had very advanced uh, heart disease. Both uh, were very advanced disease with a high risk of premature sudden death. And if you look at this uh, data, Brazil and three other Latin American countries are in the top uh, 10 countries with the highest mortality due to cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> Show you another case, case number three. Only a 36-year-old man, the same profile, obese and diabetic. Uh, diabetes is increasing uh, tremendously in, in our continent. Uh, heart disease suspected, and you can look at the scan and see that this patient already has multivessel ischemia, high ischemic burden, advanced disease, and again, a high risk of death. What these three patients have in common? They all have advanced disease in relative young age. They are all diabetics. They live in a country where cardiovascular mortality is high, number six in the world. They were all lucky to have access to technology and to be treated, because they all survived. But their treatment was costly, required revascularization. The disease was too advanced. And their disease is an economic burden, especially in low to mid income countries. Cost-effective strategies to deliver care is essential to all countries, including where I come from in Brazil. If you look at this data from the WHO, for both men and women, you can see that in high-income countries, mortality is decreasing for men and is decreasing for women. In low to mid-income countries, the opposite is happening. Mortality is increasing for men and mortality is increasing for women. And this has a lot to do with our discussion here about technology utilization in different parts of the world, and specifically I'm talking about Latin America here. How is nuclear cardiology utilized around the world? And there was an IEA project a few years back looking at utilization of nuclear cardiology in different parts of the world, and very interesting how it heterogeneous this is. As Prem just showed, there's high utilization of nuclear cardiology in the USA. There's moderate utilization in Europe, Oceania, and Japan. In the rest of the world, there's actually low utilization of nuclear cardiology, with some exception in some countries 
in Latin America, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia have a, a, a little bit better utilization compared to the rest of Latin America. So in most of the Latin American countries where 600,000 million people live, there's low utilization of nuclear cardiology. So very interesting. There's high utilization where mortality is lower and low utilization where mortality is higher. There's something wrong in this equation. I want to give you some data that we keep track uh, very closely. Uh, we monitor what's happening in our city, and I'll give you an example of Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, uh, Curitiba is a city of approximately 1.7 million uh, inhabitants. Uh, we, we keep uh, a nuclear cardiology registry there, and we publish from this registry. And what you see here on the left, each of this orange dot, it's geographically where a patient that had an MPI lives. So we're even looking at geographic differences within our city to be published uh, uh, soon. Uh, in terms of gender differences and in terms of severity of ischemia, 11% of the men in our, in our experience have severe uh, uh, perfusion abnormalities, and approximately half um, of that uh, percent, so approximately 5% of the women will have similar degree of abnormality. <clears throat> Again, from our large registry, 33% 30, uh, of our patients will have an abnormal study. And this is very different from what Pram showed what's happening in uh, California, for example. And here are the different degrees of um, abnormality. And we're seeing some interesting phenomenon in the past three years. We're seeing less severe ischemia being replaced by more mild uh, abnormalities. And we're still trying to understand what we're seeing. But in, in terms of the number of studies, we've been pretty flat for several years. At least uh, six years or so, uh, we plateau the utilization of nuclear cardiology. Now let's understand a little bit better this example of the city of Curitiba. How is the human development index in Curitiba? It's, uh, it's very similar. It's different than the Latin America. In Latin America, there's a lot of disparity. And the human development index in Curitiba is very similar to Europe. This is a region of high uh, European immigration. And let's look at the trends, what's happening in terms of technology utilization in, in that region. We're seeing uh, increasing CT progressively, not affecting the numbers of MPI. But as I told you, the number of MPIs done, 800 MPIs per 100,000 inhabitants per year, is exactly what we see in Europe. Very interesting. And what's also very interesting is when we look at cardiovascular mortality in our city, it's decreasing both total cardiovascular mortality and premature deaths. They were very interested to study the deaths below age 70. So both are decreasing. Now, how much technology utilization has to do with that? We don't know. Probably a combination of lots of prevention, good care, and some degree of technology also. It's very important, of course. And when we compare the numbers, if Curitiba was a country, and we compare to the country of Brazil, or as mortality is much lower, and, and, and even the decrease over the years is, is, looks much better than the, the rest of the country, and it looks very much like Austria in, Switzer in uh, Swi uh, Switzerland, actually. So we're moving a step forward now. And, and it's a unique experience in the world at a city level. It's called Curitiba Heart Project. What we're doing, we're screening heart disease to prevent premature deaths. So we're, we're looking at asymptomatic men age 40 to 69, women 50 to 69. 
We stratify at a population level using the uh, Framingham risk score. We re-stratify the intermediate Framingham using calcium score. And we re-stratify risk again when we find calcium score above 400. And the focus here is not on revascularization. The focus here is on promotion of health and secondary prevention as needed. And what do we intend to do? We intend to separate those patients that are really low risk from the patients that are high risk. And what we want to do is target. And we're starting with 10,000 patients. We expect to find 5 to 7% of patients with a calcium score above 400, where we plan to do MPI according to appropriate uh, utilization uh, guidelines. There are other opportunities to improve quality in Latin America that we, we have been working on with the IEA, and that has to do with radiation uh, exposure and uh, the INCAP studies that you all heard about, uh, a study uh, that evaluated nuclear cardiology protocol in 65 different countries. And what did we learn from this in Latin America specifically? That if we uh, adjust our doses to patients' weight, if we use more technology in terms of software uh, uh, to reduce injected dose, we can do a tremendous job uh, in terms of reducing patient exposure. And whenever possible, to do a two-day protocol instead of a one-day protocol is one of the ways we found to reduce patient radiation exposure. So when we con consider the challenges and opportunities for nuclear cardiology in Latin America, certainly there are many regional differences uh, considering at the country level. Availability of technology is very different. So the situation that I showed you from the place where I work in Curitiba is probably not the same in many other different parts of, the, of Latin America. There are economical issues related to that. There are healthcare policies, and unfortunately, uh, in Latin America, there's a lot of preference for invasive procedures. Uh, and of course, this leads to unnecessary revascularization. At the scientific level, the training of professionals working in nuclear cardiology is very heterogeneous. There are some turf battles between uh, nuclear medicine, cardiology, and radiology. Uh, the same as in other parts of the world, there's uh, modality uh, uh, um, uh, battles. Uh, clinicians lack information about the use, appropriate use of different technologies, and we have to work on this uh, uh, um, in a sustainable way. Uh, Patient-centered images seldomly practice, unfortunately. And and and. How can we reduce these differences? I believe we can reduce by promoting good quality work, be useful in nuclear cardiology and de deliver good quality work, keeping up to date with the current knowledge and current guidelines. I think it's very important to participate on cardiology meetings and clinical discussions. Uh, explore opportunity to, stop, to participate in regional scientific meetings uh, for physicians, uh, give talks and uh, promote nuclear cardiology utilization, especially in Latin America as a gatekeeper to invasive procedures. Build relationship with referring physicians. This is very important. Know the strengths and weaknesses of nuclear cardiology. Nuclear cardiology, we can quantify ischemia. We can do ischemia test with exercise. And this, these are two very unique and very important uh, 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 characteristics of our modality. Explore scientific cooperation with other specialties and institutions. Explore opportunities to do research and publish. And if possible, be proactive helping healthcare providers, public, private, with protocols. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we have Professor Ignacy Carrió to talk about the role of nuclear cardiology in Europe and Middle East. 
Thank you very much. It will be uh, on Europe only. I cannot speak about the Middle East. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I may, I, I, maybe I cannot speak either about Europe because uh, Europe as such, uh, it's a, I mean, Europe is 50 countries with 50 different governments, uh, health policies, uh, cultures, languages. So it gets very difficult to uh, say to speak about uh, something like nuclear cardiology in Europe. Um, here's some summary of what I'm, I will comment on. Uh, there are huge differences among countries in Europe, huge differences. Overall, there is a slight decline in myocardial perfusion um, e uh, imaging in, in general, globally in Europe. Uh, we have well-established guidelines, that's true. Uh, radionuclide ventriculography in Europe is used for chemotherapy control only. Innervation imaging uh, with MIBG is very seldom used, despite uh, we have had plenty of clinical trials and we have published a lot, if you wish, but the clinical use is, is very rare. And there is also limited use of PET, which is confined to infection, assessment of infection or inflammation. Uh, and myocardial blood flow measurements, but only within clinical trials. This is not used uh, as clinical routine in general in Europe. Uh, I will uh, quote the Avinci study, uh, not because uh, uh, we came very well out of this uh, study, which was the case, but because this was a, uh, a study that was funded by the European Commission, and therefore, it was taken into account by the, by the health uh, payers, by the governments. Uh, you may recall that in this, in this uh, study, uh, which was a multi-center European study involving uh, 475 patients with a stable chest pain and low prevalence of coronary artery disease, uh, computed tomography um, um, came as more accurate than non-invasive functional testing. Uh, for detecting significant coronary artery disease as defined invasively. And this is why, I mean, the health uh, payers uh, offer uh, more support to uh, uh, coronary CT than to other uh, testing. Despite then, I mean, some studies uh, of the Abinci uh, emphasize that uh, when one is using a hybrid approach, we, when we combine the findings uh, on CT with functional testing, then is when per vessel or per patient we offer the, the, the best performance. Um, we have not much uh, data, I mean, updated data on, 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 on practice, on activity. Uh, we have, for example, this uh, study in, uh, in Germany that was published by Oliver Linder um, one year ago. Uh, notice in Germany, th this is uh, myocardial perfusion aspect per 100,000 uh, inhabitants um, uh, in 2015. So despite what was published 2017, this is 2015 data. Uh, and uh, between brackets, you have the changes to 2012. So notice the huge heterogeneity. I mean, it is amazing. So uh, in, in some parts uh, of uh, Germany, they may do uh, close to 200 studies per 100,000 inhabitants, while in other places they do uh, maybe 70 or 60 hmm? within the same country. So it is extremely variable, uh, the use of uh, nuclear cardiology, even within a country such as, such as Germany. So imagine, I mean, within, within Europe. So the, the, there are huge, huge variations. Um, and this is the same set of data. In, in Germany, there was a decline in myocardial perfusion uh, imaging utilization until 2010, and then it recovered. It has not been the case in other countries. In, in Spain, for example, or in France or in Italy, we have had a continuing decline um, over the last, I would say, uh, 10 years. I mean, in, in my country, for example, that has that is due uh, to the um, uh, the use of uh, magnetic resonance imaging for myocardial perfusion. That's the situation in my country, but it's different in the different countries. So in Germany, the good news is that there was a recovery after the year 2000, 2010. 
This is data still from the same from the same study and refers to Germany. Um, uh, as you can easily see, uh, MIVI and tetraphosmin uh, dominate. Uh, thallium has almost disappeared, and that is true for most countries uh, in Europe. Uh, there is a substantial um, amount of, pa of patients uh, who undergo um, a stress testing only. That's uh, in common practice in, in, in a number of centers in Europe. When the stress, the stress imaging is normal, then the patient avoids the, the rest imaging. So that's a, uh, a picture of what, what is the situation uh, in uh, Germany. But um, uh, I think that in other countries it is similar in, in the sense that um, uh, cestamibi and tetraphosmin dominate. Um, the type of stress, um, ergometry by large, there is some grow in, uh, in uh, pharmacologic uh, uh, approach. Um, adenosine is the, the, the drug that is um, widely, widely used. Uh, um, although there is a decline in the, in, uh, in the use of ergometry, which does not correlate well with the increase in adenosine or regadenosine, maybe. But that's the situation in Germany. Um, this is the use of uh, gated aspect in myocardial perfusion. Again, data from 2005 to 15. Notice that uh, the use of gating is clearly increasing, both for a stress or rest or a stress and rest. So that, that is a very, very clear trend. And I think it applies also to other countries, such as uh, mine, for example. Uh, regarding who is referring the, the patients to myocardial perfusion scanning, uh, in Germany, ambulatory care cardiologists uh, dominate, uh, while hospitals or uh, internists, internists or primary care physicians less. Um, I, I would say that that's the same in, in Spain, and most likely in France and Italy as well. This is data from uh, Spain. Uh, this is a survey of 2015. Uh, 42 centers uh, replied, uh, 10 uh, with private practice alone. In total, 40,000 patients. Uh, this is, you will see that uh, myocardial perfusion imaging accounts for 69%. Um, EV uh, refers to radionuclide ventriculography equilibrium. In, in, uh, 17%, FDG 12%, now is less, FDG is much less than 12%. Uh, first pass 1%, MIVG less than 1%, anecdotal, or uh, diphosphonate is also, also anecdotal. This is data from the Spanish Nuclear Cardiology Working Group. Uh, this is also data from uh, Spain, the, the number of centers that a study, uh, more than 200 uh, uh, patients, you will see in the, in the, in the different bars. Um, uh, most centers study o only 200 to 500 uh, patients a year. So very few centers study more than 1,000 patients a year. Uh, we do more and more pharmacologic stress. That's, that's true. We use adenosine in general in most centers. Uh, still, the proportion is uh, almost half-half no nowadays. That's true. Then I will also quote the, the uh, INCAPS study that has been extensively quoted here because it was sponsored by the IAEA. Um, uh, you may recall that, again, there is a variety of countries here coming uh, from Europe. It was stated that the mean effective dose is lower and the average quality score is higher than in the rest of the world. Uh, well, I'm happy with this, but I'm not sure if this is true. Uh, there is a large variation in the, in the number of centers per country. So this is dominated by the United Kingdom and Sweden, as you can see. Uh, most uh, uh, labs from the south of Europe are from Italy. So what is done, what is practiced in uh, university hospitals does not reflect well what is the health care. There are centers that do differ, say. But anyhow, the, the incomes indicates that we do well in Europe and that the, uh, the, uh, the quality uh, scores also uh, uh, performed uh, very well. 
Uh, this is um, just numbers on uh, the proportion of patients studied with uh, stress first or rest first or stress only. To me, it is remarkable the proportion of patients that do uh, uh, stress only as compared to the rest of the world. This is the uh, the quality parameters. Um, the, the, you may recall that there were eight parameters that were scored, uh, and it came that uh, in Europe the uh, the quality of scores uh, were higher than the uh, the rest of the world. That reached a significant level. You may you may see um, you may see on the slide on the on the columns to the right that the. Um, the centers that had the higher scores uh, are more frequently encountered or seen in the column that belongs to Europe as compared to the column that belongs to the rest of the world. Um, something that is coming in Europe is the uh, progressive utilization or the, deploy, the deployment of the CCT cameras, dedicated cameras for, for cardiology. And now it has come that with this type of dedicated cameras, we can uh, quantify myocardial flow reserve in a way that can compare well with PET, uh, taken as a gold standard. Uh, if this uh, um, is reproduced by different centers, uh, if, this, if this comes, then it might be that uh, this will help a higher utilization of myocardial perfusion imaging uh, in Europe. Uh, the issue of the guidelines is important. We've done a lot of work in this regard. We have uh, the EANM procedural guidelines for radionuclide uh, myocardial perfusion imaging with uh, SPECT and SPECT CT. There is a 2015 uh, version. We have uh, hybrid cardiac imaging, the uh, joint position statement by the European Association of Nuclear Medicine, endorsed by the European Society of Cardiac Radiology by, and by the European Council of Nuclear Cardiology. 2011, we have a paper that was a proposal for a standardization of uh, MIBG imaging um, that was published in 2010. Then uh, we have the uh, guidelines on radionuclide imaging of cardiac function of 2008. And finally, if you check the European Society of Cardiology guidelines of 2015 for the management of infective endocarditis, you will see that PET is well placed there. So it is, we, we are well positioned in these guidelines that are also endorsed by the European Association of Cardiothoracic uh, uh, Surgery and the EANM, of course. So once again, my remarks, uh, when you talk to Europe, you have to consider that we, we are 50 countries. There are huge differences among countries. Uh, there is a slight global decline in myocardial perfusion imaging utilization in Europe. Uh, despite we have uh, well-established guidelines that can be checked and used by uh, countries beyond Europe. Um, radionuclide ventriculography nowadays is used uh, in chemotherapy control only, and that's because uh, still most of the clinical trials that uh, assess uh, cardiotoxicity uh, recommend the use of radionuclide ventriculography instead of ECHO, at least in Europe, most clinical trials. Uh, require um, radionuclide ventriculography for ejection fraction assessment. Uh, innervation imaging, I'm sorry, but it is very seldom uh, used. Uh, and I believe that PET in infection will, will be more and more uh, used in Europe. And myocardial blood flow, blood flow measurements will stay, maybe at least with, with PET, confined to clinical trials. Uh, with CCT cameras, if this works, then that might be extended to clinical routine, at least in some centers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, our next speaker is a friend from Argentina, living in South Africa. Uh, Professor Carlos David Liebhaber is going to uh, to talk about the the clinical practice of nuclear cardiology in Africa, and uh, I want to apologize because I have to leave. Carlos, uh, please accept my apologies, and uh, it was a pleasure to be here, uh, sharing this session with you, and see you soon.
And just to briefly, I'd like to say to America, who's come all the way again to help this wonderful Congress, and he's been around a long time helping us, and have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice trip. Thank you. Great to be in Australia, in this fantastic city, and attending this wonderful and very well organized Congress. Well, in Africa, we have still a long way to go in the practice of nuclear cardiology. There are three aspects that we need to review. Education, infrastructure, and population. First of all, when I mean f disclosure, I am a cardiologist and I am a nuclear physician. There is nothing like a nuclear cardiologist in South Africa. When I mean education, I mean education for the cardiologist, education for the nuclear physician. Infrastructure, as you saw from Joao's map, if you paid attention, in Africa, you have nuclear medicine in some countries in the north and extreme south. All, all the countries in between, most of them don't have nuclear medicine, never mind nuclear cardiology. First problem. Second problem is education. In South Africa, for example, in the country where I live, a cardiologist can do anything. There is nothing like an invasive and a non-invasive cardiologist. A cardiologist can do anything from clinical cardiology, echo, stress test, to invasive cardiology. More than that, I always tease them that the number one indication for cath in South Africa is to have a groin. <laughs> Second indication is to have a wrist. I always say that the erotic fantasies of a cardiologist in South Africa are related to groin and wrist. <laughs> so if you were born without a groin, you have a chance of not being catheterized. <laughs> For many years, the reports for nuclear cardiology have been done by nuclear physicians. But that wouldn't be a problem. It was by nuclear physicians without good or proper training in cardiology. So if you have too many of that, the cardiologist loses trust. This is getting much improved in the last, I would say, 15 years. I don't think you need to be a cardiologist to report properly a nuclear scan. But for people coming from Europe or from the States, this may sound as a surprise. When you read that the sensitivity and specificity of a myocardial perfusion scan is in the higher 80s, that is absolutely not true. It is true in the top centers in the States or, or in Europe or wherever it is done, in the, under the best conditions read by well-trained specialists. That doesn't mean that someone not well trained or without a good lab is getting. So don't tell me that the, 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 the sensitivity and specificity of a test. Same thing as when we get publications that cabbage surgery mortality is 1% or less. Is 1% or less in your center? No, it is in the centers that published. You have to check how good it is in your center. So we try to educate the cardiologist 
educate the nuclear physicians. We get in South Africa referrals from many patients from other countries in Africa, they come to South Africa. We are privileged, Mike and myself, to be in very, very good centers. We have access to nuclear cardiology, we have access to PET. Other countries don't even have access to nuclear medicine. So even the physicians come and train four years with us. It's fantastic, they get very good training, they pass their exams, some of them brilliant physicians, you know, sponsored by the International Atomic Energy Agency, they don't have where to go back because they are sponsored, they are supposed to get a job when they go back, there is no place to go back because they don't have cameras or the cameras are not working or they don't have the budget for them. And the third aspect I want to discuss in South Africa, for example, is the population. Let me see if I push the right. So the socioeconomic economic status and development of a country have an impact on the mortality and morbidity. So there is a shift with industrialization of disease patterns. So patients that normally had nutritional deficiencies and infectious diseases, now they shift to chronic diseases of lifestyle, like cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and cancer. This is called the epidemiological transition. So this is happening in South Africa. Diseases of lifestyle increase, but we still have the burden of poverty-related diseases. So chronic diseases of lifestyle, like cardiovascular diseases, are becoming major causes of death. And of special concern is that these cardiovascular diseases is occurring in younger patients than in the developed countries. According to the South African National Burden of Disease, diseases of lifestyle were the leading cause of death, even more than HIV AIDS, injuries and other infectious diseases in 2000. And they expect but that by 2020, increase will be to 150%. What happens to the individuals that moved from the country to urban areas? The, a, a very nice study, the heart of Soweto study. Soweto is southwestern township. is a township attached to the to Johannesburg, next to Johannesburg, with well over a, a, a million inhabitants. They did a study on 1,700 uh, uh, individuals. Most of them were black Africans, most of them women. And they found that 78% of those subjects had more than one major risk factor for heart disease. By far, the most prevalent was obesity. Then 33% of them had high blood pressures. 13% had elevated cholesterol. And there was correlation between the increasing BMI and the other risk factors. So what do we do in nuclear cardiology? Of course, we have the constraints, like everyone else, of the health care system. We have to practice clinically effective and cost-effective medicine. So we need modalities that add a, a, a information over what we have. So it's known that myocardial perfusion imaging has incremental or added pronostic value over clinical, historical, 
and data from non-imaging components. We know that, that whether we use exercise or vasodilator, it has added value, no doubt about it. Left ventricular dejection fraction measured by other modalities has been shown to, to restratify the patients for cardiac events. And Sharir showed that post-stress left ventricular ejection fraction measured by gated spect provided significant information too. Well, the angina cascade, we all know it very well. And only at the end of the exercise, when we have the maximal myocardial oxygen demand, the patient complains of angina. I say it's like when the husband cheats on the wife. The victim is the, only, the last one to find out. The problem is that ST depression in the stress test also happens late with oxygen demand. So the, the, the stress ECG, we know the sensitivity and, sensitivity and specificity is quite low. So we know that myocardial perfusion imaging is more sensitive and more specific than exercise and, and vasodilator pharmacological stress. And of course, the maximal benefit is observed in patients with intermediate probability. We also need to check for risk stratification patients that have suspected coronary disease without limiting symptoms, as Joao Vitola very well showed. And we know it's been shown that myocardial perfusion imaging has very low likelihood of adverse effects, less than 1% when you have a normal scan. That is true also with pharmacological scan. It's true with pharmacological scan, the risk is a little bit higher, but still, as a whole, the, 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 the normal scan patient is at very low risk. The risk increases with the severity of the perfusion defects, and doesn't matter what kind of test we perform. Of course, with the same SAM score, the non-diabetic patient is at less risk than the non-insulin dependent diabetic or the insulin dependent diabetic. This, uh, 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 this slide, if, if I don't show it, probably Joao Vitola will say what kind of cardiologist are you. We all showed it. And this one clearly shows a benefit for the clinician. So basically, what do we do? We do, as uh, Rory Hachamovich and, uh, 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 recommended, patient with no ischemia goes for medical therapy. Patient with more than 10% ischemia goes for cath. Patient with mild to moderate ischemia depends if he has symptoms or he has non-perfusion markers. Viability. Of course, we need to identify patients with viability because we can help them. On the other side, we found out that those patients with viable myocardium if, you are not, if they are not referred for revascularization, they do worse. So it's not only we can help them, we have to do something for them. There are quite a few uh, tests that we can use, and each one has advantages and limitations. You can see very clearly the Highest sensitivity, oh, sorry. Where did I go? 
The highest sensitivity is for FDG PET. The highest specificity is for the dobutamine stress echo. All the other examinations are more or less at the same level of sensitivity of, and specificity. But with the STITCH trial, we have been having problems to convince the, our cardiology friends of the need. They said, fantastic, with the STITCH study, we'll cut everyone and we'll send everyone for surgery. Actually, the STITCH trial has strengths and, of course, weakness that I am not going to discuss them. We, we know them, but there are quite a lot of weaknesses. I wouldn't decide to send a patient for cuff and for revascularization based on the STITCH trial. And the other thing I want to point out, the fact that we have so many possibilities to identify viability doesn't mean that we can use all of them. If you are in a big center, you can send the patient for PET, but most of the medical aids will not accept a PET for viability still in South Africa. A, a, many patients will not have access to PET for viability. And just, so, sorry, I am not going to. And so my conclusion is we still need to educate but we need to find solutions for Africa. It's not enough to bring the physicians to, to, to South Africa, for example, and train them, and they have nowhere to go. Uh, just to conclude, let me tell you, as a cardiologist, very often I am asked by people, doctor, should I eat fats? Shouldn't I eat fats? Should I drink wine? Is wine good for you? Isn't so I checked a bit, especially because we are in Australia. And you can see that the Japanese eat very little fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, or Canadians. On the other side, the Mexicans eat a lot of fat, also suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, and Canadians. Japanese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, and Canadians. The Italians drink lots of red wine, also suffer red, fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, and Canadians. The Germans drink a lot of beer and eat a lot of sausages and fats and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, and Canadians. The Ukrainians drink a lot of vodka eat a lot of pierogies, cabbage, cabbage rolls, and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans, Australians, British, and Canadians. So my friends, after I showed you this, you might get to the same conclusion that I did. Food is not the problem. <laughs> Speaking bloody English is what's <laughs> killing people. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Our last talk of the session, we all know um, Kimmy Dr. Jim, who's given us some wonderful insights on MIBG, and he's going to be speaking on the challenges in Asia, and I assume particularly Japan. Thank you very much for your introduction. He has a very good summary of Japanese conditions. So. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, recently uh, regional and ethnic differences among patients with heart failure in Asia were summarized in a uh, European Heart Journal. When I see this uh, paper, uh, more than 5,300 patients were summarized uh, with, uh, patient, in patients with reduced ejection fraction in 11 Asian countries, but the prevalence of CAD was uh, quite different depending on the locations. What, what happened? Cool. Okay. For example, uh, we can uh, notice significant heterogeneity 
across 11 uh, Asian countries, incomes are quite different. Low income country, uh, the mean age is young. And in a high income country, uh, such as in uh, Hong Kong and Japan, it's old. And the body mass index is also quite different. In low, it's lowest, uh, for example, in Japan, it's uh, around 22 to 23. But in the Philippines, it's 27. And ischemic etiology is also different and more prevalent in the Southeast Asians and less in Northeast Asians, including Japan. Uh, but also, the device uh, implantation varied depending on the locations. So uh, when we look at the so background or prevalence of risk factors, for example, in the Malay, in the third one, uh, the CAD is in 60% and hypertension in 60%, and similarly diabetes in 50%. But in Japan and Korea, uh, coronary artery disease is around 30%, and uh, hypertension 50%, and uh, diabetes in 30% uh, of the patients. So it's quite different depending on the locations or uh, nations. Uh, now. What about the MPI studies in Asian countries? Although uh, the statistics are a little bit limited, we can note in Singapore, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and Taiwan have similar uh, number of MPI studies. But when compared to the situation in Canada and the USA, it's uh, still very low uh, number of MPI studies. Um, so. What do you think about this? The left side is the Japanese situations. Uh, in Japan, several characteristics are present. Uh, for example, thallium-21 is still used in 50% or 60% of the institutions. And the adenosine stress in 70 to maybe 60% of 70%. It's relatively high. And PET studies are limited to uh, only in sarcoidosis <coughs> using FDG. And the CZT camera is uh, so eight uh, discovery CZT system and 13 D spec system out of more than 1,000 uh, institutions. Uh, therefore, uh, or still uh, there may be some differences. Um, MIBG is 40,000 studies and gradually increasing. But anyway, when we see this one, it's very surprising. CT and geography exceeded 10 years ago, and going rapidly, uh, it's increasing. But um, MPI studies are stable. Uh, when I heard about the statistics from Taiwan, it's on the right side. The population adjusted. But in Taiwan, it's rapidly increasing. The situation is quite different. It partly depends on the reimbursement system. So, uh, fortunately, uh, indication of PCI G in Japan was changed this April. And one of the following medical evidence was necessary, and particularly, please note the third one, functionally proven ischemia is included now. So I anticipate, or I hope, the MPI, role of MPI will be increased. Uh, this is a guideline, simplified guidelines of Japanese Circulation Society. Uh, so you see it's written from coronary CTA directly to coronary angiography. This dotted line is not written by me. It's included in guidelines. So uh, many doctors prefer to use dotted line. Uh, eventually, it causes high rate of PCI. But because the so risk stenosis of the PCI is not so high in these patients, prognosis is good. So um, I think the, the situation should be changed even in Japan. The fraction of nuclear studies in Japan is uh, something like this. In the United States, it's very high uh, in, uh, for cardiac studies. But in Japan, it's around 20%. And uh, Although there are many studies in the United States and also uh, in the European countries, we need to adjust uh, many in many ways, for example, diagnostic use and prognostic use. I'm going to briefly talk about it. The population-specific normal database is unnecessary in Japan. 
although there seems to be a small difference, uh, but uh, for example, the inferior wall of the men, uh, the normal database, and uh, uh, apical or anterior wall attenuation is different. This causes uh, significant differences in uh, uh, final results. So we needed to make a normal databases fitted for Japanese patients. Uh, this is a, a right coronary artery in men and the anterior ischemia due to LAD. Please note the difference in the scores. And normal uh, ejection fraction is also different if we use QGS. Uh, for example, in women, it's 67% uh, in the United States, but in Japan, it's 74%. Actually, more than uh, so, 70% of the patient uh, in women have a small heart. So uh, we also changed uh, the algorithm to calculate uh, small heart effect more effectively. And uh, prognostic data are also different. For example, this, these are uh, J-axis investigation widely performed in Japan uh, since 2001. Uh, focusing on the consecutive registration and uh, asymptomatic diabetes or CKD and so on. Uh, but anyway, uh, we found a significant correlation to the uh, summed stress score uh, if the, it's severe, high event rate, higher event rate. But please note severe heart failure requiring hospitalization has a large fraction. But if we, we use the same scale as the U.S. study on the right side, uh, we can notice that the total event rate is one third or even one fourth, uh, depending on the uh, so same sum stress score. Uh, but the factors are quite similar. For example, in, on the left side, uh, if the patient doesn't have any uh, so complications or uh, normal scan. Uh, it will be, uh, event rate will be about 0.5%. But it depends on the prior MI and the diabetes mellitus. On the right side, it depends on the diabetes mellitus and the CKD. It's a uh, tendency is similar. Uh, similarly, early revascularization is effective in patients with ischemia if patient has more than 10% ischemia. So it's also the same. Uh, for example, this is a patient who, uh, ha who have uh, mouth, uh, anterior ischemia, and a 27-year-old patient, ejection fraction 40%. Uh, for example, when we see uh, this sort of abnormality, we can uh, calculate the total event rate based on the LV ejection fraction, EGFR, presence of diabetes, and some stress score, and so on. Uh, this sort of event rate is also adjusted for Japanese patient. And next, a J-COMPASS study was performed uh, comparing initial diagnostic strategy for stable angina pectoris. And we can notice that uh, risk of MACE is similar between MPI and CT groups as shown on the left graph, uh, but uh, revascularization rate is quite different. It's higher in CT groups than SPECT, 1.6 times higher. And if CAG was used first, it's 5.4 uh, times higher compared with SPECT. Uh, these situations cause a higher uh, PCI rate. Uh, the similar study was also uh, done in the Taiwan. Uh, you can easily understand that if you use initial MPI, uh, the event rate is lower compared with initial CAG. Uh, although the nations are different, but their tendency is quite similar. So MIBG is uh, gradually increasing in Japan, uh, fortunately. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, on the right upper panel, uh, the patient ejection fraction is 25%, uh, but the actual low, uh, risk is low, ejection fraction is 25%. In the right lower patient, ejection fraction is 45%, uh, but the uh, final risk will be 32% per five years. Uh, this sort of uh, analysis can be effectively done using MIBG. So uh, this sort of risk model can be used for the risk stratification uh, from observation, uh, optimal medical uh, treatment, 
to cardiac device treatment or more uh, aggressive treatment. Uh, similarly, uh, in Japan, most of the studies are uh, non-invasive imaging will be performed by stress MPI or coronary CT angiography. If we can include many kinds of backgrounds or comorbidities, and then we can calculate post-test risk evaluation again, uh, this will be very effectively used for therapeutic uh, decision making from low risk to high risk patients. Uh, but uh, we need to apply uh, these sort of ideas and explain about these ideas to cardiologists, and I hope uh, good practice will be done uh, from now on, too. So uh, in summary, uh, although background conditions in Asian countries are very, very heterogeneous, similarly in the European countries, but uh, similar risk factors have been noted for the occurrence of serious cardiac event. So the similar ideas will be applied. And prognostic database and the diagnostic database should be uh, population fitted. It will enhance the reliability or uh, so acceptability by the cardiologist. And the nuclear cardiology has potentially important roles in diagnosis and management of cardiac disease. Uh, this uh, comment is exactly the same in other uh, countries. But uh, anyway, uh, nuclear cardiology is still very underutilized. Thank you. I'd just like to thank all the speakers. We've finished on time. And a particular thank you for the fantastic insights to all the country, and particularly to Carlos for his good bloody English. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.